Sunday afternoon for the men. Uh, all men are invited to attend those. During the month of October, we'll be collecting items for the food pantry at Calvary. You can leave those uh, either in Randall's Sunday School classroom, uh, or you can make a monetary donation as well if you want to do that. Just mark your check and your envelope food pantry, and we'll make sure uh, that gets where it needs to go. Our church will also be providing dinner for the Love, Inc., Loving Your Neighbor classes on Tuesday, uh, the 24th. Amy Campbell is going to be coordinating that. If you can provide some assistance uh, for Amy, please see her after the service, or you can give her a call. Uh, I'll ask you to please uh, continue to be in prayer for several of our church members who are going through some challenging times here lately. Uh, the Brooks family and the passing of Jim's father. Uh, Kitty Templeton and the passing of her brother, and please continue to keep Evelyn Howe in your prayers as well. Who's here today? It's good to see you, here, Evelyn. Uh, Della, do you have an announcement this morning? Yes. Uh, uh, this is uh, going to be uh, quite a quick lesson, but mark the calendar for October the 28th of Saturday uh, to help uh, to outreach to our uh, loving store here right here. Jessica, you have anything this morning? Just trunk or treat um, is October 28th, <laughs> coming up, 6 to 8 p.m. If you do plan on having a vehicle decorated, please sign up with Melissa. We know who to anticipate, what to expect, and we are accepting candy donations. And then also, Michael Smith is our young adult for the week. It's also his birthday, so be sure to give him some happy birthday. Great. Sue, you have anything this morning? Uh, tonight, our ladies' Bible study will meet as well as tomorrow morning. Our uh, bells will rehearse tonight at 5.30. Our orchestra folks will not meet tonight. Um, Rick Rickman is our friend of the week, and Rick is here today. So, happy friend of the week, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, Brenda will have our prayer list this morning. <laughs>
Would you stand as we sing our opening hymn of praise, singing about the holiness of our great God? thankful for a day of rest to raise our voices to you and we are especially thankful father that we have a heavenly father in you one whose love never fails whose patience never wanes and whose protection is constant and clear to you we cry abba knowing that you will never reject us and never turn away for it's in christ's name we pray amen a praise team comes to sing about the mighty power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
Our responsive reading for this morning is listed in your bulletins. Would you please follow along? The Lord lives. May my rock be praised. The God of my salvation is exalted. Be exalted, Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your might. Proclaim with me the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I will praise you in the great congregation. I will exalt you among my many people. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from afar. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted over all the gods. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. I exalt you, my God, the King, and praise your name forever and ever. Our offertory hymn. Two stanzas of the beautiful gospel hymn, Blessed Be the Name. Would you stand once again as we sing? <laughs>
ready our hearts to hear the message this morning. Let's join in singing two of our chorus with that we've learned. First one, think about his love. When you consider what the Lord has brought you through these past weeks, what he's brought you through in the past months and the past year, his love and his goodness and his grace has brought us through so much. And it will continue to carry each of us till we see him one day. Let's sing this chorus two times through this morning.
If you were uh, with us last week, you'll remember that we talked about worldviews and how our worldview is the way that we think about life, about others, about ourselves, the way we kind of think about everything. And we also talked about the eight statements that make up the Christian worldview and how only 9% of Christians, just 9% of Christians in this country actually believe in and live out a Christian worldview. And one reason why that number is so low is because a lot of Christians just aren't taught the reasons for their faith. They're pretty clear on what they believe, but not on why they should believe it. And in a culture that's moving away from faith, knowing why you believe the things you do is hugely important. So we're going to spend a few weeks talking about what makes up a Christian worldview. And we're going to start this morning with the most important part of that worldview. God is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, and he still rules. Amen. There is... A God. That's about as basic a truth as there is, isn't it? And you might be thinking that nobody sitting in here this morning is doubting at all if there is really a God or not. And maybe that's true. I hope that's true. But as we'll see in a little bit, even the strongest Christians sometimes struggle with doubt. So if that's you, then I hope today's sermon is going to help ease some of those doubts. It's an interesting point to make, though, that because of sin, nobody can come to a belief in God on their own and under their own power. Before anybody can search and find God, God has to first draw them to himself. Jesus says in John 6, that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, in a sense, God draws everyone. To it by giving us plenty of reasons to believe that he exists, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But the first thing that you have to know is that we don't have the ability to come to know God. That's why God has to draw him, draw us to himself. The second thing that you have to know is that we can't know everything about God. Even in eternity, we won't know everything about God because he existed for an eternity before we were even born. And we've talked about that before. St. Anselm was an early church father, and he pretty much had the best definition of God that you can come up with. St. Anselm wrote that God was that than which nothing greater can be conceived. In other words, God is the greatest, the best, wisest, most loving, most knowing, most powerful being you can imagine, and then some. That's why we can't know him completely. But even though we can't know everything about God, God has chosen to reveal parts of himself that can be known because he loves us. The best and most complete way that we can know God is through Christ because Christ is God. And so we can know God through what Christ said and did and through how Christ lived. The second way, that God's revealed himself is through the way that we know what Christ did and said and how he lived, and that is the Bible. And we're going to talk more uh, in a few weeks about the reasons why you should believe everything your Bible says. But for now, it's enough to say that what we learn about God in Scripture can't be found anywhere else. For example, in Isaiah 43, 13, we learn that God is all-powerful. God says, there is none who can deliver from my hand. I work and who can turn it back. In Proverbs 5.21, we learn that God knows everything there is to be known. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders on his days. In Psalm 139a, we learn that God is everywhere. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. God is holy. God is good. God is love. God tells us all these things about himself in the Bible. And God is changeless. Now, we often overlook that. God cannot change because God's already perfect in every way. We think about how God knows everything and he's more powerful than anything. And there isn't a place where God can't see or is not. But have you ever thought about how important it is for you that God cannot change? 
Remember what Anselm said. God is the greatest possible being. So if God can change his purposes, or his attributes, or who he is, or in his being, then that change would either have to make him better or worse, right? But if he changed for the better, then that would mean he wasn't the greatest possible being for you when you first trusted him. And if he changed for the worse, that would mean that he's now less than perfect, wouldn't it? If God can change in any way, then everything about our faith starts falling apart. And so does our understanding of everything about our lives. Thankfully, we have Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. And we have Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. The fact that God cannot change is one of the most important things about it. It's the reason why we can trust him with everything and depend on his every promise. Given all that, though, it's pretty obvious that not only is God real, he's revealed enough of himself through Jesus and the Bible for us to know him and for us to know our sin and for us to know how God has overcome our sin so that we can spend eternity with him. But to people who aren't Christians, the Bible isn't proof enough to believe that there's a God. Because to them, this is just an old book full of old fairy tales. And not even Jesus is enough, because what we know about Jesus is largely found right here. So when it comes to the question of whether there's a God or not, most people say at best, we just can't know for sure. But in Romans 1, Paul says that is completely wrong. Even without the Bible, there's enough evidence for God's existence that nobody will be able to stand in front of God and say, well, you just didn't do enough to show me that you're real. So let's take a look at some of that evidence. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. This morning we're going to be reading verses 18 through 25. Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And this is God's word. <coughs> it's easy to look at the world today and get a little depressed, isn't it? I'm sure we've, been, we've all been watching the news this week. Everything that's happening in the world in Israel and Ukraine still. Everything that's happening in this country. So few things seem to be going right and, or, and so many things seem to be going wrong. And we're often left to wonder where God is and what God is doing. According to the Bible... The reason why things always seem to be going wrong is sin. It's the sin inside all of us leaking out in all the horrible things that we do to each other. It's the sin in us that stained the whole world so much that just a few chapters over from here in Romans 8.22, Paul says all of creation has been groaning for renewal since Adam and Eve sinned. So what is God doing in the midst of all the sinning that we do? Paul says in verse 18 that God is revealing his wrath against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now remember we talked about wrath a couple weeks ago, didn't we? About anger. When you're wrathful to somebody, you want revenge against something that they've done. Now would, a God, would God be a good God, a loving God, if he wanted revenge against somebody? No. He would. When the Bible talks about God's wrath, it means God's anger, not against anything he's created. Because remember, what did he say about everything that was created? 
It's all good, right? It's his anger against sin. In verse 18, Paul lists two sins in particular, ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, those two sins pretty much cover everything, don't they? Because ungodliness is a failure to revere God, and unrighteousness is a failure to revere your fellow human beings who are made in God's image. And Paul says that our unrighteousness suppresses or keeps down the truth. And what is that truth? Paul lays that out in verses 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now, like we said, there are a lot of things about God that we just cannot know because he's God. He's so far be beyond our comprehension that it's useless to even imagine what he's really like. But Paul says here that there are some things about God that he's allowed us to know. And those things are so plain and so obvious that nobody has an excuse to not believe in it. No one has an excuse for their sins against him. And nobody has an excuse to say that God isn't justified in punishing us for those sins. So what are those plain and obvious ways that everybody can know that something beyond us, some higher power, exists? I'm glad you asked, because there's a lot of them. But today I'm going to only give you three. We can know there is a God by creation, by nature, and by our deepest longings. Let's take those one at a time. First, we can know there is a God because of creation. And by creation, I mean the moment our entire universe began. Uh, William Lane Craig is a Christian philosopher and is just about the smartest person in the world as far as I'm concerned. Half of what he says just goes straight over my head. But he has a great argument for this. And here's how he states it in simple terms. According to every bit of science that we know, everything that exists has to have a beginning, right? Whether it's us or a tree or a mountain or a galaxy, something had to cause that to come into existence. Well, the universe exists, doesn't it? Obviously, because we're all here. So the universe had to have a beginning, too. And science has confirmed that. It's called the Big Bang. That means something had to cause the universe to come into existence. Something had to create the universe. And if that creator is outside of our universe, right? He has to be outside because you can't create anything that you're already a part of. He, has to, he also has to be outside of time, which means that creator has to be eternal. He has to be immensely powerful to be able to do all this. He has to be immensely wise to plan everything down to the smallest detail. And we call that creator God. That is a pretty good argument, isn't it? But it gets better because there's proof of a God like that, written inside those first few seconds of creation. I cannot disagree more, by the way, with Christians who say that science is evil. No. That, that's, I mean, it's just not true at all. My, half my family's alive because of science. And you should never be afraid that science is going to discover something that disproves God, because that cannot happen. Here's what science can tell us. From the biggest galaxies, to the smallest particles, everything exists because of very basic physical laws. And those laws are so precise that if they were off, even by a fraction of a fraction, nothing would exist. No stars, no planets, no life at all. The force of gravity is one of those. If the force of gravity was changed by just 10 to the 60th parts, None of us would exist. And how big is that number? 10 to the 60th parts. It is 10 followed by 60 zeros. It's a number that's bigger than the amount of cells in your body. It's more than the amount of seconds that have passed since time began. If just one of those huge amount of numbers was off by just a fraction, none of us would be here. 
The same goes for how fast our universe is expanding, is flying outwards. That number is 10 to the 120th part, so twice the amount of seconds since time began. 10 followed by 120 zeros. If just one of those numbers were off, we'd have no galaxies, no stars, no sun, no planet, no nothing. Or how about this number? This is my favorite number. This is called the Penrose number. It's named after a famous physicist. It's the most important number to know. The odds that at the moment of creation, our universe had the exact ingredients to form life in the exact measure was 1 in 10 to the 123rd part. 10 followed by 123 zeros. That number is bigger than all the atoms in the universe. Those are the odds of our universe coming into existence with everything already in place to produce life. 1 in 10 followed by 123 zeros. To put that number into perspective, you'd have better odds if you rolled a pair of dice and it came up snake eyes 200 million times in a row every day for 41 minutes. <laughs> now tell me there is not a God. Now, to understand all those numbers and physical laws requires a brain bigger than I have. So God makes it even simpler. Paul says in verse 19 that he makes himself plain. And he does that in the natural things of this world. In Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, here's what David writes. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Did any of y'all happen to see the mountains yesterday afternoon? Mm -hmm. I have been looking at these mountains for 51 years. I have never seen the mountains look like that yesterday afternoon. Or have you ever been at the beach at sunset and you look out over that water? Have you ever been out in the woods or by a lake or a stream and just had this sudden, overwhelming sense of how beautiful everything is? That feeling is God tapping you on the shoulder and saying, yeah, I made that. <laughs> think about how beautiful it all is. And then think about how much more beautiful its creator has to be. When we look through a telescope at all those stars, we see the glory of God. When we look through a microscope at the tiniest cell, we see the intelligence of God. When we think about the fact that there are 60,000 miles of blood vessels inside your body, we see the wisdom of God. Everything in nature cries out in praise of the one who made it all. One last bit of evidence to give you. And in a lot of ways, this is my favorite because everybody's experienced this at some point. Our deepest longings point to a creator. Here's how that works. Every natural desire you have has something in this world that can satisfy that desire. Right? You get hungry. Well, there's food. You get thirsty. Well, there's water. But there are some desires in us that nothing on earth can satisfy. We all desire peace in our hearts, don't we? We all want joy that can't be taken away. We all want to be completely safe. We all want our lives to go on forever. We all never want to feel pain. But what in this world can give us any of those things? Nothing. So there has to be something more than this world to satisfy those desires. C.S. Lewis said it perfectly. He wrote, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Now, of course, people try to argue this point. Some of them will say, well, no, I'm not happy, but if you give me $10 million, I'd be happy. <laughs> Would you? Because there's a lot of rich people out there, and they don't seem happy to me. That's been tried for a few thousand years. It hasn't worked for anybody yet. Not even Solomon. You could gain the whole world. Still wouldn't be enough to fill your heart. God didn't just write himself into creation. He didn't just write himself into nature. He wrote himself into the deepest part of every human heart, too. And that's why in verse 20, Paul says that none of us has an excuse to say, no, there's no God. 
But plenty of people do still make excuses, don't they? Why is it that for some people the truth of, of God is more real than anything in the world? But for others, it doesn't seem like anything you try to tell them makes a bit of difference. That's what Paul talks about from verses 21 to 25. Our God isn't, isn't a God who just sits up in heaven and leaves things to take care of themselves. He is constantly chasing us, constantly trying to get our attention, constantly drawing us toward him. But remember, we still have free will. It's still our decision whether to believe in God or not. So what happens when people don't? In verse 20, Paul says that since everything in creation points to a creator, no one has an excuse to say they don't believe in God or that there isn't enough evidence for them to believe in God. But these people still make excuses, all kinds of excuses. They don't honor God as creator in verse 21. They don't give thanks for the wonders of creation, for their lives, for the way that God works in, in and around them every day, and just for who God is. None of their thinking is pointed toward heaven. It's all pointed at themselves. And so what happens is something like kind of a downward spiritual progression, starting at the end of verse 21 and going through verse 22. Because first their thinking gets bad, because they're not looking to God anymore. And then their hearts grow foolish. And then they grow dark. So once your thinking is futile, your heart gets darkened. And once your heart is darkened in verse 22, a, a terrible thing happens. You think you're wise, but you're a fool. That's the world we live in now. That's the nation we live in now. Because as a society, the first thing we did was turn our backs on God. We stopped honoring him. We stopped giving thanks to him. And so our thinking became futile. And then our hearts were darkened. And now we're becoming a nation of fools, even though we keep saying we're the smartest and the wisest nation in the world. That's the path, because God will keep drawing us to him. But at a certain point, he's going to say, all right, have your way. That's what happened to Pharaoh, remember? His heart was hardened. But if you look back to the plagues in Egypt, God keeps warning and warning Pharaoh through Moses, he better listen to me. But for the first five of those plagues, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. It's his own choice. It's not only starting with the sixth plague that God starts hardening Pharaoh's heart. Because at that point, God says, okay, fine. Here are the consequences of your decision. That's where we are now. God has given us evidence of his existence everywhere we look. Whether it's in the farthest galaxy or the deepest ocean or the nearest forest or our own beating hearts. But many of us still say there's no God. And more than that, there's no reason for a God. But we all still worship something, don't we? That's another evidence of God, by the way. Scientists are starting to discover that religion is actually built into us, into our DNA. We're born with a desire to worship. And that desire is going to be fulfilled in some way or another. No matter who we are, we worship something, don't we? You don't have a choice in that. The only choice you have is in what you worship. But too many do what Paul says in verse 23. They exchange the glory of the immortal God, the creator, the ultimate source of every good thing for things that are never going to satisfy him, never going to fill them, and never, ever going to satisfy them. And because by their own free choice, they exchange the truth of God for a lie that there is no God in verse 25, God gives them up in verse 24. God removes the restraints that his love and his grace have put on them and just allows them to just go about our lives, their lives as they see fit. Because that's their choice. That's how we have the world we have today. And atheists will say, well, if there's a God, and if God wants everybody to know him, then why doesn't he just put a big sign in the sky? Would that work? I mean, we live in a time when so much can be fake that we're not sure what's true anymore and what's a lie. If God made a sign in the sky, how many people would believe it? And how many would just say, well, that's just fake? Or that's just an alignment of some stars somewhere. That's not God. That's natural. Remember the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? 
The rich man's sent to hell, and he begs Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn his family that there's more to this world than what we can see and hear and touch. Remember what Abraham says? If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen to some guy who's back from the dead. Jesus came back from the dead. For a lot of people, nothing will make them believe there's a God. And that's because even though they say they're being rational and scientific and realistic, they're not. They cry out for proof, but deep down they don't want any proof. Because deep down they're, they don't want there to be a God because they don't want to be held accountable for their lives or for anything that they do or for any choices that they make. For 99% of people, atheism is not a head problem. It's a heart problem. The truth is that God has written clues about himself everywhere we look. But they're clues, aren't they? They're not proof. And that bugs us, doesn't it? Until you realize that God, God's not interested in proof. He's interested in faith. God will give you just enough to say, yes, he has to be there. But then you still have to take that step of faith towards him. That's how he wants it. Because faith means relationship. And in the end, that's why he's written himself into those first moments of creation. And that's why he's written himself into those fundamental laws of nature. And into our mountains and the sky and the stars and into your deepest desires. Because the maker of it all wants a relationship with you. Your own personal proof for God is in your own life. It's in the experiences that you've had with him, in those dark times that he pulled you out of, in all the small moments of your most boring day when he gives you just a little glimpse of who he is. But those doubts still come, don't they? Even to us, even to the faithful. And that's where I want to finish this sermon because it helps to understand why there are some out there who say there isn't a God, even though there's so much evidence for him. But it helps us more to understand why sometimes we have our own doubts. And we all do. Those doubts come when we watch the news and we wonder what in the world God's doing. Or when something terrible happens in our lives and we wonder where in the world God is. I want you to listen to me. Because somebody out there needs to hear this today. We all know there's a God, right? And we all know that God has a plan, right? But sometimes that plan makes absolutely no sense to us, does it? You know why? Because we're just given little tiny pieces of it. Tiny little pieces here and there. Sometimes we can look back to our past and we can see what God is doing. But we can hardly ever see that plan unfolding in the present. And of course, we can't see how it's going to unfold at all in the future because that hasn't happened yet. Most of the time, when you start doubting God's existence, it's because what you're really doubting is God's plan. You can't understand what he's doing or why he's doing it, and so you start wondering if God's even there. And that's okay. You're not supposed to understand it. But sometimes that's the problem, because as a believer, you start doubting when you get so focused trying to figure out God's plan that you stop looking at God. Don't do that, because you're not able to know hardly anything about what that plan is. Focus instead on God, because you're able to know a great deal about him. You know him from prayer. You know him from his word. You know him from church. You know him from your own experience. All of those tell you that God is infinitely powerful. Every moment of your life, every moment of history is being guided and controlled by him. God is infinitely good. Everything he does in your life is for your benefit. Sometimes not immediately, but always eternally. God is infinitely loving. He's promised never to leave you and never to forsake you. And God is always, always, always trustworthy. He keeps his every word. You know a whole lot more about God than you do about God's plan. Whether it's for your life or for this world. So don't trust in a plan that you can't know.
trust in a planner that you can know. Because that is going to lead you past all your doubts to an unshakable faith. And if you're ready to take that step of faith today, I invite you down here as we sing our closing hymn. Let's pray. Father, this world, all of us are given to doubt. We don't see as you see. We only are given glimpses of shadows. We don't know as you know, but we live our lives in ignorance of what truly is and what truly matters. And yet you are a God who is not afraid of our doubts. In fact, you welcome them because when we doubt but truly search for you, you will always meet us, you will always encourage us, and you will always strengthen our faith. We pray that you continue to show us more and more of you every day. And we thank you that in every breath, in every star, in every blade of grass, you shout out your presence and your truth. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand as we sing the first and the last stanzas of How Great Thou Art?